Hey, it's Mark with The Thoughtful Gamer, and I am here to talk about more hot takes that I solicited from Twitter. I already released one video about this, uh, but I still had more responses from my call for your board game hot takes and weird opinions and whatever you wanted me to talk about in these videos. I've selected five of the best this time, so let's talk about them. First, we have Travis saying vocal, vocal consumers do not represent the majority. All the issues about Kickstarters you hear people complaining about on social media, like stretch goals, are in place because the majority of consumers support them. And, yeah, this is kind of true. I don't know if you can make an argument for a majority or minority. That would be very difficult to determine. But enough people support the practices that result in successful Kickstarters to make them successful. However, I think there's a bit more nuance here on what it means to support something. So, people support these things, these practices. So uh, we could talk about uh, certain practices being, for instance, uh, tapping or tapping into certain psychological uh, aspects of the human mind that we all have. Um, so uh, Skinner box type stuff, uh, FOMO, things that tap into FOMO, fear of missing out, uh, things like stretch goals. Those can be supported through our actions without us actually liking them. So there's a difference there. From an economic sense, your preferences are revealed through your actions. That's kind of a basic aspect of economic analysis, is that you have preferences and those are revealed through the way you act. But that's different than what we talk about with preferences in a more colloquial sense of things that we like or enjoy or enjoy supporting. So for instance, one could be influenced by the presence of stretch goals, but at the same time, not like stretch goals. If you were to ask them, what do you think of stretch goals? And they may not like it. That doesn't mean they aren't psychologically influenced by them. And perhaps uh, they have bought a game knowingly or unknowingly because of the presence of stretch goals. That, that was the, the thing that pushed them over the margin to buying that game, uh, but they could still not like them and have a you know, leave a sour taste in their mouth if you ask them about it. So, yes, things, certain things that tap into those psychological tendencies do tend to be effective, but that doesn't mean you can say that everyone supports or likes them. Uh, there's a distinction there that I think is important. And I personally don't go in for a lot of Kickstarters because I'm trying to be hyper aware and hyper conscious of the way I can be manipulated and influenced uh, with these psychological tricks, for lack of a better word. So I kind of support this. I kind of don't. I think there's more nuance than was represented in this tweet, which you know, is the case for most tweets. So I'll give you a break, Travis. Travis responds again. We have a second one from him saying that comparing different types of games to each other on the same scale doesn't make any sense. A five-minute party game and the best Euro of all time can both be rated 10 out of 10 because their fun and utility is entirely context-dependent. And I sympathize with this, but I rate everything on the same scale. I can see the argument, but at the end of the day, I can look at something and say, well, I had uh, eight and a half out of 10 amount of fun, uh, or enjoyment or interest in this game for this heavy game and I had 9 out of 10 for this lighter game I, I, I feel comfortable with the way I'm writing things even, there's, even though there's a lot of arbitrariness to it but at the end of the day for me uh, the ratings aren't that serious I find them interesting and fun uh, to do but I, I try not to take them too seriously it's, it's all kind of uh, picked, our, again, our, somewhat arbitrarily at the end of the day, even though I try to put a lot of thought into it and try to be somewhat consistent. So if someone comes on, up to me and says, I, I think it's, for me, in my mind, it's uh, silly to rate heavy games and light games on the same type of scale. Doesn't make any sense to me. Sure, it doesn't make any sense to you. I can do it. I can completely understand why other people can't, uh, but ultimately it's not an important issue of an issue uh, enough to make a big deal about this. So I, again, I kind of agree, kind of don't. There's a little bit more nuance there. Cameron Lucas says, 99% of the time life's too short to play ugly games. Uh, obviously I'll make some exceptions if the game is unique enough. Also, ugly is very subjective. Sure. Obviously, uh, ugly is very subjective and what's, what looks good is very subjective. Uh, I disagree with this though. I think that... 
I've heard the opinion before, and Cameron is getting at this. I don't necessarily want to hold them to that, uh, but it's very similar to something I hear quite a bit, and that is that uh, why play uh, a game that doesn't look good because there are so many games that look good. Well, maybe the game that doesn't look good, if you played it, would become your favorite game. Like, I hear these statements, and sometimes not even about the aesthetic, sometimes about... And name any aspect of the game. They're like, well, there's this one thing uh, that's not ideal, but there's so many other good games. Yeah, but you're, for me at least, maybe for some people, if a game is somewhat enjoyable, they're fine with that. For me, I'm looking for the best games. I'm looking to find new experiences I've never had before. I'm looking to find stuff that will blow my mind. I'm looking for the very, very best. And anytime I consciously purchase a game or try to play a game, it's because I think there's a chance it'll bring me that experience. I'm on the hunt for really exciting, novel, interesting, challenging, fascinating games. I'm not just looking for games, yeah, that was fun. Most games are in that category where, okay, that, that was enjoyable, uh, you had a fun time, right? It's a bell curve. Most my, my The top of my bell curve, and I've talked about this before, is around six and a half, seven out of ten. Because most games are pretty fun. But if I just thought that like all games were either pretty fun or not fun, I wouldn't really be interested in this hobby. I'm looking for the games that are exceptional. And so if I'm going to pass up on a game experience because it's ugly and miss out on the possibility that it's an exceptional game, that doesn't make any sense to me. Now, of course, if you're so invested in the art and the presentation of a game personally that no game that is ugly to you can be exceptional, then I get that. But some of the best games I've ever played are ugly, right? I love 18xx games. They don't look great. We're starting to see some that look, start to look pretty good, but most of them don't look great. Same with cube rail games, same with... Uh, many war games. Hex Encounter games? Yeah, they look fine sometimes. They go from, oh, that's better than I thought it was, to, wow, that's what I expected it to be. But they could be amazing to me. And uh, if if the art matters that much to you, that's fine. I can't argue against that kind of preference. But saying, well, I'll just ignore all the games that don't meet this criteria because there are so many good games. That doesn't make sense to me because I'm not looking for good. I know I can find good. I've got good all around me on these shelves. I'm looking for amazing. And an ugly game could be amazing. Next, we've got Ian saying, <laughs> with, a, with a number of different hot takes, first of all, 1830 is a dumpster fire. I, sure, if you think it's a dumpster fire, it's one of the most influential games of all time. You know, there's not many games that, like, create their own subgenre. Uh, Francis... Tresham made two of them, right? He made the Civilization game, and he made the 18xx game. What else is there? You got Magic the Gathering, you got Dominion, you've got... I don't know what other games made their own subgenres. It's a, it's a small list. So, while 1830, I've only played it once, and it certainly was not my favorite 18xx game, I still have to respect it. It's And, and I know people have played it hundreds of times, and it really dug into it, and they say it's amazing. I trust them on that. But saying it's a dumpster fire, eh, I'd love to see your argument there. I'd love to see the details of that. I'd be very curious. Next, he says Vital Lacerda games are overly complicated for no reason. I don't think it's no reason at all. I think it's because Vital Lacerda likes complicated games, and he likes games where you are trying to figure out the machinations of the game system. And there's a lot of people, including me, who also like that kind of game, what I call the Baroque Euro, right? The Gears Within Gears style of Euro game. People like that. There's, It's not that there's no reason for it. It's that the complication is the reason, right? The complication is the enjoyment factor of trying to puzzle that out and figure it out. Um, I, I don't see, I see, I, I, I've played games that I feel like are complicated for no reason, like they just needed editing, I don't get that sense much with Lacerda games. Maybe he pushes the line. Maybe, for instance, on Mars, I've only played it once, but I was thinking, man, maybe this is a little too much for 
without much gain. Uh, but I think there are many, many other games that do it far worse, uh, even if they don't aren't, in the end, as complicated as Lacerda's games. Next, he says, buy fewer games. Yeah, probably good monetary advice. I won't argue with that. And stop kickstarting everything with minis. I don't kickstart everything with minis. I have expressed many times that I'm not a big fan of these minis heavy games. I, I don't get it. But if you love minis, sure, go for it. There's nothing wrong with liking plastic and liking figures. I don't know why you would buy board games with miniatures rather than just the miniatures in that case. But again, it's a preference. I can't argue with a preference in that way when I can't see... I can't see anything inherently wrong with it. It's just a preference in that case, just like I have a preference uh, towards uh, Lacerda games. And I can totally see why people are like, wow, that's too complicated. I can't argue against that. Sure, yeah, they're complicated. Uh, if you if you love stuff with minis, sure, I don't get it, but I can't really argue against it as a point. I do think perhaps that a lot of these minis heavy Kickstarters result in a lot of buyer's regret but that's my hunch i would love to, actually that would be a really interesting thing to research buyer's regret with kickstarter i wonder if anyone's actually done that hard to measure because when you invest so much money and attention into a kickstarter that you think is going to be amazing it's hard to clearly look back and see wow was that game really that good or was it just a really good marketing campaign? But maybe there's enough time now, enough distance, where we can start getting some interesting data there. Finally, our last one from MDV. This is the spiciest one yet. The hottest take. Gamers that don't enjoy cooperative games are weird. If it's because of alpha gamers, then stop playing with those people. There's two kind of sentiments here. The first one, that... If you're having an alpha gamer problem, that it's the it's a people problem, not a game problem, I pretty much agree with that. I do like it when games try to have mechanical solutions to the alpha gamer problem, though. I do think that's a nice bonus, but I don't think it's necessary. I don't think a game is lacking anything if it doesn't have that. Uh, so it is ultimately a people problem, but I think... You know, you can look at a game and say, wow, that was a really clever way to get around the alpha gamer problem, or at least mitigate it a bit, and that's a bonus to that game, in my opinion. But the idea that gamers that don't enjoy cooperative games are weird, no, they're f it's a fundamentally different experience. A purely cooperative game is a solo game shared amongst many people, right? If, it, if there's no hidden information, nothing like that, it's a solo game that you split up the parts, right? Because it's the game system... The game's going to have different mechanisms in a system and some kind of way to introduce randomness, variation in the game. And it's your job to figure out how to play the odds the best you can. That's a very specific type of game. And I can totally see why someone would not prefer that type of game because it ultimately always is going to boil down to whatever the randomization mechanism is. And I can totally see how people would prefer competitive games where there obviously can be random randomizing mechanisms, but a large part of the uncertainty can also be come from other players. And the idea that you would prefer your uncertainty coming from the decision-making process and the complexity of another human rather than a randomizing mechanism in the game, I can, I can understand that preference. I don't think that's weird at all. In fact, while, I mean, I love cooperative games. My, my top two games in my last top 100 list are cooperative games. But cooperative games have that, that hurdle to overcome of not exposing that simple randomizing element. And I think that's where Pandemic falls a little bit short. I think it's too exposed. Uh, which is why I prefer Forbidden Desert for a Leacock uh, cooperative game. And I tend to prefer more complex cooperative games because those randomizing elements are more hidden. But the idea uh, that I really want to put myself up against another human, and that's where I find challenge and excitement in gaming, totally get it. It is more nuanced. It's more 
uh, it, it, it feels richer. And so while I do love cooperative games, I totally understand that. I don't think that people who don't enjoy cooperative games are weird at all. I disagree with that hot take, but thank you, MDV, for submitting it. Uh, that's all I've got for now. I'll definitely be doing more of these. I like discussing these different issues. If you have any you would like to see me talk about, uh, go ahead and comment below. Right? Let's get some more. These are the best of the initial batch I got a couple months ago. I'll probably tweet out uh, for more, but I'll look from other sources. Comment below. Don't forget to subscribe, like the video, and you'll see more stuff like this from me. I plan on doing more videos in the, the future of various types. If you enjoyed this Hot Takes one, be sure to let me know, and I will definitely be doing more in the future. Thanks for watching. Talk to you soon.